My name is Chana. I am a reporter for Startland News. I have been with Startland and in Kansas City for almost a year now, and it has been such a pleasure to report on the community's ecosystem of entrepreneurs, startups, and small businesses. So I am very excited to be moderating this event, and we just have an incredible panel. So to start off, we have Ms. Carla Harris. Carla is a 33-year Wall Street veteran. She serves as a vice chairman, managing director, and senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley. She is also a successful gospel singer, author of the books, Strategize to Win and Expect to Win, and hosts the podcast, Access and Opportunity. On top of all of this, Carla created the Multicultural Innovation Lab at Morgan Stanley. We are very excited to have her leading this conversation on diversity and inclusion. Sandy Kemper is not currently in Kansas City, but resides here, and he is the founder and CEO of C2FO, which is the world's largest market for working capital. Before founding C2FO, he established several other ventures, including Perfect Commerce and Agriculture Future for America. He also co-founded Yup KC, which is an organization devoted to developing young entrepreneurs. Finally, we have Howard Schultz. Howard's claim to fame is making Starbucks coffee into the global experience that it is today. After an overseas business trip where Howard visited an Italian cafe, he came back to the States and opened his own cafe, a giornale. Howard purchased Starbucks in 1987 and turned it in the brand into the cafe style concept we know today. After serving as a CEO for several years, Howard is now the Emeritus Chairman of Starbucks. So thank you again to all the panelists who are joining us today. The event is called Nothing to Fear, How Fear Continues to Destroy Diversity Initiatives in Companies. And Carla, you once mentioned that fear has no place in one's success. So could you talk a little bit about why you think fear is one of the main roadblocks to diversity and inclusion efforts? Yes, and thank you so much, Shanna, for uh, interviewing us today. Uh, and thank you to Startland for having me as a part of this very important conversation. I'll tell you that fear is one of the things that I think has been the biggest impediment to the progress around DEI. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that leaders, let's start there, I think have real trepidation and fear around embarking on those conversations. In the last 15 months, you've heard a lot of companies talk about courageous conversations that they're starting to have, which gives, which gives a little bit of credence and evidence to the fact that people have been afraid up until now to talk about what they consider to be tough issues, whether it's around race or whether it's around gender. And I think it's also the fear of making a mistake. Uh, we certainly have been in a litigious society within corporate America, so it's been the fear uh, of litigation. If you say the wrong thing, it's frankly the fear of looking stupid. If I say something that really uh, exposes me as not really getting it and knowing about the person on the other side of the conversation. So I think fear has been a real impediment, but let me give you another thought about fear. You know, every CEO wants to have a legacy of having sat in that seat. And up until now, the predominant components of the report card has been, you know, how did you expand? Did you get greater market share? Did you have record profitability or record revenues or um, you have customer engagement and customer acquisition that was beyond any Anybody else in your industry. Uh, and up until now, I would argue that the HCM piece, you know, the human capital management piece has not been a really big part of a CEO's report card in the court of public opinion. But I think now we're in an environment where that's going to be a decidedly important piece of the report card. And I think because these issues uh, were so uh, surrounded by fear and perceived risk that you know, most CEOs said, listen, I'm, I'm not going to deal with that DE&I thing uh, because, frankly, the guy, and it usually is the guy, the guy before me didn't really handle that, and the guy before him didn't really dig into that. And if I get it wrong, it could be a catastrophe uh, and, frankly, could ruin my legacy. Now, I'm not saying that people thought about that in an active way, but I am suggesting that at least unconsciously, that had to be part of the reason that they didn't really go for it because we have been in the diversity and inclusion conversation, I believe for 30 years. The first time I heard it as a serious conversation in any corporate walls was circa 1990. And then in the early 90s, you started to see companies do more things demonstrably around diversity. 
but I think that there's still a lot to be done because I think another impediment is that we've been looking at diversity through the wrong, the wrong lens. You know, in the beginning, when the conversation started, China, it was all about the right thing to do, the moral thing to do. But frankly, as people, you and I may not agree on the right thing to do, but as business animals, we are likely to agree on the commercial thing to do. And I think that if people had really embraced the need for diversity as a strategic component to survival and competitiveness, then we would be a lot further along. We, we would not have had the trepidation around measuring it, around being more vocal about where we were, about being more intentional about making it happen and the execution. So um, I, I think that's how fear has been a major, major impediment as a personal leader and even from an organizational standpoint. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you talk about how these themes go back all the way to the 90s, because I think a lot of people think of it as a newer concept and ideas. Um, so I'm curious, Howard and Sandy, if you would like to add on to how you've seen diversity and inclusion efforts evolve throughout your careers and where you see them today. Howard, why don't you jump on and I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. I think you're muted, Howard. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I think what Carla just said is is not only spot on, but it's it's kind of a secret uh, within the boardroom, especially within a public company. And it's not so much fear uh, as it is uh, a lack of understanding, a lack of sensitivity, and a lack of lived experience. And so. What, what we have tried to do, and, and as I say this, I want you to understand, as I wrote Carla this morning, we're all still learning. Uh, and Starbucks uh, has done a number of things well, but we are still learning. We're not a perfect company and we're gonna make some mistakes. I think the first thing though is you, you have to answer the question, first and foremost, what is the core purpose and reason for being of your company? And of course, uh, part of that answer is a financial performance-based company. But the, the flip side of that, and what we've learned over the many years of Starbucks is performance is based and linked directly to a set of values, the culture, and the guiding principles of the company. And maybe another way of saying that is trying to lead through a lens of humanity. Uh, the Diversity and inclusion are words that, as Carla said, have not been part of the lexicon of corporations, especially public companies for many years. But the truth is that those companies that have done well have recognized that in order to produce creative tension, ideation, innovation, uh, the only way to do that is to surround yourself, A, with people who are smarter than you, who have a life experience different than you, and that there's diversity of thought in the room. The Starbucks board was a very diverse board with Olden Lee at, uh, at my side for 15, 20 years, who was an African-American man who was the head of HR at uh, Frito-Lay. And Melody Hobson, who of course has become uh, the chairperson of Starbucks today, who's been here 20 years and we're so proud of that. But I think uh, what we've tried to do along the way is really recognize that success is best when it's shared, regardless of who you are in the company, regardless of your life experience, and certainly the regardless of your ethnic experience. And so when I look back at what we've done in order to try and succeed and build a different kind of company, equity in the form of stock options to every employee, including part-time people, comprehensive health insurance 25 years before the Affordable Care Act, and now free college tuition in conjunction with ASU for every single employee, which is, I think, an act of trying to recognize that it is not a zero-sum game in trying to be financially successful. And the best way that I can say this in, in just my closing initial remarks is this. More often than not, Managers are taught that innovation is customer focused. 
And, and innovation, by the way, is not a line extension or uh, a pricing or new packaging. Innovation must be disruptive. And, and we're taught to try and disrupt the marketplace. But great companies today that are building great enduring enterprises are recognizing that innovation must be both customer facing and employee facing. And that means that you've got to try and do everything you can to disrupt the status quo and demonstrate to your people the merits of what you stand for. And the reason for that is self-serving. You want to attract and retain great people. People are looking for a sense of belonging and be part of something that they can really believe in. We have a fracturing of trust and confidence in the country. We have a fracturing of trust and confidence in corporations. So if you can build the kind of company where there's a thread and a currency of trust based on a set of behaviors that's consistent. And when I say consistent, it means that not only when it's easy to do, but when those decisions are hard to make. That's when you have to show up. And everyone in your company today, no company can hide. Everyone knows everything. And you, know, you must show up in a way that is consistent with that original question. What is your core purpose and reason for being and manage the company against those principles? And certainly diversity and inclusion is a core component of building a company that is steeped in humanity. Spot on. And let me add just a couple of thoughts to it. It's not, it's not just what we're doing in our companies or what our peers are doing in their companies. As I look at some of the challenges that are occurring around the world, we're getting into this sort of homophilistic echo chamber of our own nonsense. So homophily is the tendency for people to want to affiliate with and be like others that look like, smell like, taste like, are like them. Heterophily is the tendency for us to want to associate with others who are different from us. Heterophily is the number one ingredient for innovation. Heterophily, the ability for us to understand and lose, lose our sense of self by looking at others and understanding what they're doing causes the creation of innovation. Homophily is the adoption of innovation. So all of us, whether we're big or small or in tech or non-tech, the currency of the realm right now is innovation. If we don't have heterophilous environments capable of creating more innovation, we're going to die. And die as companies, die as nations, die as a people. So fundamentally, we have to embrace heterophily. We have to push away homophily. We have to get out of our echo chambers of our own sort of silly nonsense and expand our view and our horizon to include many others who do not look like us, are like us, or talk like us, think like us, because that's the, that's the, frankly, to me, that's the secret to success. And, you know, being a technology company and a small company at that, it's a lot easier for us to do this at C2FO than it is at Starbucks or Morgan Stanley or other large corporations. We're, we're lucky to have an environment that's very transparent. We're lucky to be small. We're lucky to be very um, open to innovation because we're an innovation company. And, and so from day one, we've always had this belief in, in the diversity needs, but we weren't always as good at getting, getting and giving voice to it. Uh, and lately, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks in our company, and certainly I have found more comfort in giving voice. So to Carla's point about fear, I'm coming out of a banking world where I was a CEO for a number of years. You're right. I think there was a, a fear of failure, fear, a fear to, uh, to embrace these difficult uh, topics, so cert certainly back when I was a banker in the 1990s and, and earlier. Now, I think it's, it, it's, it's, you have to do it. I mean, the, the company is just a vessel for holding human capital. And if we don't do this, if we're not taking those risks, if we're not putting ourselves out there, our people aren't going to be with us and our customers aren't going to be with us. Yes, it's the right thing to do, of course. But to your point, it's also it's it's, it's sort of the table stakes for having a great team. Jana, can I add something here for a second? Because I, I, I tell you, gentlemen, uh, you I was already excited about having this conversation with the two of you. Now I'm really excited about having the conversation because I'm thinking, oh, yes, somebody else sees the connection because I, I have long been giving the business case around diversity and when i say long you know for the last five years because I, I kept hearing people say still again 25 years into the conversation what's the business case around diversity and i have been tying it directly to what you all have said around innovation and i start with this if you agree as you both have said 
that innovation is the dominant competitive parameter across all industries, then you have to agree that you need a lot of ideas in the room because after all, innovation is born from ideas. If you need a lot of ideas, you need a lot of perspectives because ideas are born from perspectives. If you need a lot of perspectives, you need a lot of experiences because perspectives are born out of experiences. And if you need a lot of experiences, you better start with a lot of different people because experiences are born from people. So you must start with a lot of different people in the room to get to that one innovative idea that will allow you to obtain and retain a leadership position in your industry. And that is the business case around diversity. Thank you all for sharing. And that's great because I want to know for some reason, diversity and inclusion have just become like this, re this really weighted term and there's so much pressure behind it. But for leaders who want to get to that innovation, what are some good first steps for them to take? How do you want to start, Shana Howard, or how do you? you go ahead, yeah, you can go ahead if you like. It's less, let's all volunteer Howard. Howard, tell us how to do it. Yeah, I, I wish I had all the answers. Uh, here's, here's an interesting uh, analog to what we learned when we decided that we were going to hire thousands of uh, veterans who were, who were returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And we got off to a very rough start. And the rough start was that the veteran who was coming in for an interview uh, aside from the fact that he or she had such anxiety uh, about the situation, his or her resume was not applicable to the job. And the person who was interviewing the candidate had no veteran or military experience. And so the whole thing just did not work. The, the answer was as soon as we got somebody in the position within the HR group who was a military veteran and had the experience, the empathy, the compassion, the understanding, and the sensitivity, all of a sudden, the candidate pool and the velocity of people coming into the company changed dramatically. So what was the learning? The learning was people must see people like them inside the organization. A level of discomfort arises when you are the only black person in the room. And the question is, why am I, only, why am I the only black person in the room? And what does it say about this organization and company? And how does it make me feel? And these are all nonverbal things that are going on. And at the same time, you're trying to move the business or the decision forward when in fact, there's a lot going on inside the minds of the people in the room, not at least of which is the person who is isolated or feeling lonely. And so the issue of building a team or, or leading today is the, the values and the characteristics of leadership has got to evolve to the point where your understanding of these situations that are not new, but critically important to the organization's future is steeped in a level of vulnerability, of humbleness, empathy, compassion. And, and, and I'm gonna use a word that I'm sure is not in any HBS or business school book that you can find, and that is love. You, you, you have to be able to embrace a deep sense of understanding of the human condition today in order to attract and retain great people and build a culture that is sustainable. Now, don't mistake that on any level for not being performance driven. The price of admission for any company is financial success and growth. But we're not in the business of, of diversity and inclusion as that is our business, but, I don't think you can succeed and have financial success without a comprehensive understanding of embracing it as part of the strategic plank of the business. And the last thing I'd say is there are strategic meetings going on all the time. The subject of diversity and inclusion, which 
which, which by and large has been a HR function, can no longer be an HR function. It has to be the responsibility of every leader in the company who must take it personally. And there must be a metric assigned to that person's leadership team. And, and at the end of the year, his or her performance based on a set of criteria and a metric. HR and diversity inclusion is not an HR function anymore. It is a function of the entire organization. And those are the companies that will succeed. There should be a time when we're not talking about diversity and inclusion. It, we should be just talking about what does it take to build a great enduring company? And it's, it's, it's steeped in humanity. That's absolutely right. Now, let me jump in if I can, Carla. I know you, you've got a great finish for us on this topic, but Howard, you know, I think about it from that, that perspective of love and empathy and connection. But I also think about making it, at least at our shop, we've, we've done a couple of things I think that have been pretty helpful. So Janet, answer your question directly. One of the things that we put into play uh, at C2FO a little while ago was uh, a crew of individuals called Project Equity. And Project Equity crew is not something that resides in HR. It is our leadership inside the company. And it is there to vet all hires as we, as we move towards some of our goals relative to a more diverse population of team members, a non-diverse candidate, if selected, has to be approved by project equity. So we're putting an overlay around and not an HR overlay, but an overlay around and on top of the hiring decisions that we're making, where we're making non-diverse decisions, where we have a goal of being more diverse and we're pretty diverse as a company generally, but there's always more to do putting these leaders into a position where they are, they have to agree to that non-diverse hire. Now, the other thing that we've done as sort of a complement to the love, compassion, or love, uh, empathy, and compassion is we've asked people to consider grit. So we've always believed, and, and, and I've always had a belief that folks who have had to struggle have a little bit more grit than others. And grit is fundamental to being an entrepreneur. Grit is fundamental to that entrepreneur's success. We think of all of our owners in the company and every one of our team members is an owner in the company as entrepreneurs. So I love the idea of folks who have been in a non-majority position, having to struggle and suffer a little bit more because they are in a non-majority position. And I think that that creates grit. So we've created a grit score inside C2FO that looks to, to to the background, to the diversity, to the challenges of non-majority peoples. And we assign that as a, as a, it's not a leveler per se, it's, it's an assigned value that helps us assess the grittiness of the individual. And we find that those who have come from more difficult backgrounds have more grit. And usually folks that are in a minority population come from a more challenging background. So we actually think from a human capital and toughness and tenacity perspective, that that is a shaper of success for future hires. So Sandy, let me ask you the question. Is, is the grit score assigned to everybody? Yes. Okay, so so whether you're you're uh, multicultural or not. So therefore, okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure because yeah. it sounded like you were saying you were assigning the grit score just to multicultural candidates. So I just wanted no. to make sure. So, that, that, so that, it, it becomes could be, a real equalizer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I look at it, it's not just multicultural. It can be, there, there are so many factors that cause you to have experienced difficulty. Sure. Uh, it, could, it could be the, you know, the, the, the household in which you grew up. Yes, sir. Uh, so yes, we're sir. looking, we're looking for ways to figure that out, and we're figuring that, that that actually is something. So far, certainly in all of my interactions with with contemporaries for whom I have great respect, there's a high degree of of grit in them, and it yep. came from challenges they experienced in their life, no matter what color, what background, what sexual orientation, et cetera, they are. Right. That that grit is is really important to me, at least in my in my my estimation of people. Yeah, I could not agree more. And it's something that as an interviewer of thousands of people over my 30 plus years on the street, it is something that I actually test all candidates for. Uh, because, you know, obviously Wall Street has had a reputation of being a, a tough and rough environment. So I wanted, I do want to understand your grit and your ability to hang tight, no matter what kind of environment we're in. But the last comment that I'll make uh, is, first of all, I just want to say amen to what both of you have said. It is not an HR function. It is a leadership imperative. Uh, so it should be throughout the organization. And I think that the only punctuation I can put on this, Chana, is that in order for any effort 
around DE and I uh, and now belonging because it's it, it evolved from diversity to inclusion to equity and the holy grail in my view is belonging uh, as Howard said er, earlier on um, and we all have amen is that you need intentionality accountability and consistency and I think one of the reasons that we're not farther along in this 30 year journey, frankly, is that it's been a little bit of, of well, a lot of inconsistency. I have seen companies really focus on diversity and inclusion when we're sort of in a bull market environment where things are going well, lots of focus, lots of money, lots of spotlight. But when we get in a bear market environment, uh, it doesn't go away, but the intensity goes from 10 to two if you will, because what happens in a bear market environment, you have restructurings, you have reductions in force, and as a result, your smaller populations, which tend to be multicultural and or women, they are disproportionately hurt. It's just the math. And then when you find yourself going back into a bull market environment, you're starting all over again, building the pipeline, and you're like, what happened? And the accountability, again, I have found that it, you, the CEO can be passionate about it and speak about it every time he or she has an opportunity to speak about it, but the effort dies in the immovable middle. Um, and it's those middle level managers that have most of the interaction with your human capital. And when you lose great talent, by the time the CEO finds out about it, a narrative has been created. And so you never really get the, the real story of what transpires and those managers don't feel accountable uh, which is why what you all have just said, you know, Howard and Sandy, is absolutely right. It has to go throughout because if they don't feel accountable and they know they just need to give an explanation, but it's not going to impact those things that impact their compensation, their total reward, their their movement throughout the organization, then the, the whole effort ultimately dies and you need the intentionality. So if you don't have diverse representation at, at the top in the middle throughout the ranks where you have to have it today, then you have to be intentional about saying, oh, we need this particular role. We don't have any people of color or we don't have any women. I'm now gonna be intentional. That's who we're filling that role. And let's keep looking until we find one. And again, going back to the fear and the courage, it takes courage to say that because you're gonna get some blowback. But that's what you need in this environment. Um, and you have to be intentional about bringing people in that can help you show that, that kind of diversity. Every company would like to grow them. But to grow a senior executive from entry level to senior levels is 10 years fastest, maybe eight if you push me in a technology environment. But I got to tell you, nobody has eight or 10 years because the rate of innovation now is down to 12 months. We've gone to five years, to three years, to two years, now 18 months, now barely 12 months. And so you have to engage, you have to use lateral uh, recruiting as a, as a real tool so you can get the representation that you need today. But if you use lateral recruiting, you then also have to guard against what I like to call organ rejection. And what do I mean by that? If you know anybody that's ever had a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, they'll tell you after surgery, they need 20 drugs solely for the purpose of having the body hold on to the kidney, because despite the fact that the body needs the kidney, the body will naturally dispel that which is foreign. So if you're gonna bring people in and use that as a tool so you can get the representation that you need today, then you have to also intentionally over-invest in their success to make sure that the body holds on to the kidney. Hopefully these are ideas that our leaders today can take away with them. I want to remind the audience that we have our Q&A function and we'll be getting into those later. So please be asking those questions. And now that they have these steps to take, diversity is such a, it encompasses a lot. It encompasses race, gender, sexual orientation, experience with like veterans or refugees. How can leaders ensure that they are encompassing all of these communities within their diversity and inclusion efforts? And Carla, you can start if you'd like. Okay, I'll pick up on, on where I left off. I think it is around the intentionality. Uh, you just have to be intentional um, and look at your bench um, often to make sure you have the kind of representation, to, as Howard said earlier, to attract the talent that you want. And I could not uh, support that point more about the lived experiences. I mean, because you saw it on, on Wall Street early on before any of the firms were recruiting actively from the historically black colleges. You'd see a resume from a, a wonderful candidate, young lady from Spelman and someone who's recruiting would say, who, what, what school is that? 
you know, and somebody like me is looking at like, what, are you crazy? That is one of the best you know, liberal arts colleges in the country. But again, if you didn't know that, if you weren't trafficking in that space, how would you know, right? And so I do think that having diverse representation gives your organization a level of, of knowledge and experience that allows you to be able to go out and, and, and really tap all the talent that's in the marketplace. Um, and so I, I think you have to be intentional about that, Chana. Think, making sure that you have all groups represented in your organization so that you have the opportunity to access all of that talent that's represented by you know, all the demographic labels you just mentioned. Not much to add to that other than to stay intentional. And, and as you look to be increasingly uh, broad in your view, there are lots of organizations, and I'll speak now to the Kansas City entrepreneurs, there are a ton of organizations in KC that can help you broaden your intentional view of diversity. And they're there, they're there and very much engaged and wanting you to engage with them. So there's, and, and if afterwards, I suppose, Startland, I'll ask Startland, why don't you put together a publication, a list of those? I know you've always been so good at looking at entrepreneur resources, Startland team. Let's do, uh, let's publish out on Startland resources that can help all the companies that you serve find more diverse uh, folks. You know, one thing I, this comes to mind uh, as Carla and, and Sandy were talking, um, when people come into a new company, uh, more often than not, they have left a job or a company that unfortunately has let them down. They, they, they haven't had a, the kind of experience that has uplifted them or exceeded their expectations. If you take that unto itself, and then you take the fact of this fracturing of trust in our society, there's a large level of skepticism and cynicism in entering a company and what the leadership of the company stands for and what the values really are. And the burden of proof is on the leaders of the company. And my, the point I want to make is not unlike the imprinting of a young child, there is an imprinting period of an employee's tenure inside a new company. Especially this is for those that are coming into a company in which they don't see a lot of themselves in the company. They already in their heart and in their conscience have a feeling of insecurity and whether or not they belong. And the point is this, is that I believe that 45 days max, but more like 30. And think how short of a period that is to establish with a new employee a level of safety, a soft landing, linking that person to another person inside the company that he or she can rely on and trust. And then if it doesn't work out and there is a high level of attrition in every company in America, the cost of attrition, the cost of retraining, and then the qualitative mechanism in which everyone else in the company is observing what is going on, that we couldn't keep that really good person. Or when that African-American or Hispanic or gay person or trans person showed up, he didn't work out. And all of a sudden, the imprinting and the memory is we got, we, this is a company that really doesn't walk the talk. And that 30, 45 days, a period is mission critical, not only for the tenure of the new person, but the message it sends to everybody else, especially if you're in a high growth situation where you're hiring a lot of people. Starbucks has over 400,000 employees. We, we would not have over 400,000 employees if everyone in the company thought that what we were talking about and what we believed in wasn't true. Not that we don't have challenges and ways in which we can improve but people know that the heart and conscience of what we're trying to do is the right intention. And that 30 to 45 day period, especially for minorities and especially for people who don't fit into that box is mission critical 
to the lifeblood of the company and what it says about the company's culture and values. Thank you all. Thank you, Sandy, for the call to action with Startland. We do have some audience questions coming in. So the first one asks, why don't more leaders discuss diversity as a business case like you've been describing? Let me take a quick stab at this. Because I think there's a couple of reasons where it gets to be potentially sticky. So we, we did something on uh, for Juneteenth uh, that we felt very strongly about as a company. And, and I was not in favor of doing a press release on it because I thought that also looks a little bit disingenuous. So I think there's two reasons here. One, the people, there are folks who want to do the right thing for the business case. There are folks who want to do the right thing in community but especially if you're a non-diverse individual, if you're a you know, bald white guy like me, you're going to want to be very careful with how you seem to pat yourself on the back. And so there should be none of that ever. So I would, I would err on the side of, of action versus talking, as Howard's already said. I would be careful, uh, certainly as it relates to press, but I would be very uh, unfearful inside your company. So be without fear inside, because that's an environment that is that is unto yourself and unto your crew. I would be careful with how you promote that, because you don't want to be seen as doing something for the sake of doing something. You want to do it. You want to do it for the right reasons. And I think people have to be a little careful relative to the public publicization or making public that which they do, because I think there's a cynical eye right now on that. Because there've been a lot of folks, as Howard said, starting off, and Carla said, a lot of folks doing a lot of this that have not followed up after after BLM, after Trayvon, after Ferguson, uh, there's been a lot of talk and not a lot of action. So I, I think people are, are being a little critical of words. So be careful with the words you put out there publicly, but make sure that you're doing more than those words internally. You know, a, uh, a number of years ago, we, we started having town hall meetings on the subject of race and racism. Um, I, I don't need to tell you how concerned hundreds of people within the company were that we were gonna open up a discussion on race. And we went, we started in Seattle and we went around the country and we had 12 or 13 town hall meetings with no script, no agenda. And I don't think I spoke for more than five minutes. It was just an open mic, an open mic. And we did it. Uh, uh, after many of the unfortunate murders of young black men and riots in the street and what was going on in Ferguson. And um, I had great faith in our people that we could have this discussion. And what came out of that, aside from an extraordinary level of honesty and emotion, was we began to learn from each other. I will never forget a young woman in Texas stood up and said, I need to apologize to all of you. And then she started crying and said, I grew up in a household of KKK members. And that is the language that I was grown up with as a child. And I've used that language as an adult. She was standing up and saying this next to young black people. In Ferguson, an 18 year old black young man, maybe 18, 18 or 19 years old, stood up in front of a white crowd and said, I'm 18 and I'm gonna be 19 and I don't know if I will make it. These are powerful, truthful, honest. And I think the, the level of value that was created organizationally, uh, and this wasn't for a press release, this wasn't marketing, this was internal learning that we had to do a cleansing for ourselves. And I, I think that led to other things we've done, some of which did not work out as well as we would have liked, but we were constantly trying, as I said earlier, 
to push the envelope internally in the same way that we would push it for the customer, looking for ways to advance the company and elevate the conversation so that we could become a better organization and a better performing organization, all trying to create more trust in the, in the company based on our differences. Yeah, Carla, did you want to? No, okay. Well, thank you, and thank you both for touching on you know the balance of performance versus actual internal work. Um, I think that's definitely a conversation we're seeing a lot with more companies making statements. Our uh, next audience question asks: How do you allow innovation to come from diverse members of the team that are outside the leadership side of it? Well, I'll jump on it because it's it's an easy it's an easy answer for us at least. Um, look, as a company at our size and, and what we are expected to achieve, if we're making decisions on innovation internally in our own silo or from our leaders, we're making we're making the wrong decisions. Uh, the decisions that, you know, that are made best are the ones that are made by those closest to the customer at the edge of the network. So centralization of innovation is death. Pushing innovation to the edge is empowering those who have the interaction at the edges of the network is the way that you create innovation. So uh, I, would, I would answer your question simply to say, have a structure that embraces autonomy and authority at the edge of the network and does not ever think the centralized decision-making relative to innovation. Uh, and, and if I can add to what Sandy has said, um, I encourage all leaders to be inclusive leaders um, intentionally. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that because it's not so easy for people who perceive themselves to be on the outside of the leadership circle to actually assert their voices. There's a lot of trepidation around that. And sometimes China people just don't know how. So what I say to leaders is what, you have the responsibility to in, empower and to, to your point, Sandy, get it to the edges and let people know that you are expecting their contribution and that you are encouraging their contribution. So the exercise that I, I give to leaders, I said, the next four times that you pull your teams together, uh, try this. Here's the problem that we're trying to solve today. And I'll get the conversation started as a straw man. But you know, now Abby, I want you to add on to that. Now, Bill, I want you to add on to what Abby has said. Now, Chandra, I want you to blow that up completely. What's the devil's advocate side? What's the other side of that? And Damien, I'd like you to actually add on to what Chandra said. And what you have done is two very powerful things. Number one, you said to everybody on the team, I see you because you invited them into the conversation by name, which means you have to engage enough with your people that you know them and you can authentically invite them into the conversation, into the solution making process by name and who doesn't value being seen by the boss. The second thing that you've done is that you said, I hear you. Not only did you invite them into the conversation by name, but you invited them specifically to support or refute the argument that was on the floor. And guess what? Everybody values being heard. Everybody values being heard. When you say to anyone, I heard you, or let me repeat what I think I heard you say, you generate immediate currency in that exchange, currency that you can now use to reinvest back into that relationship. And then the intended consequence of what you've done is you now have put everybody's fingerprints on the blueprint. Everybody on your team is equally invested in the success or failure of whatever that endeavor is. And it doesn't get any better than that. So that's how the leaders bring in people who might perceive themselves by title or seniority or person to be on the outside of the circle. And our next question comes from actually one of our students on our Next Gen Advisory Board, a young, just 17, 18 year old lady. Um, she asks, how essential are diversity initiatives in retaining young professionals as employees and leaders within today's companies? Where's, where's my 100% emoji? I need to have just the ability to put up completely, totally, 100%. It's <laughs> fundamental. What oxygen, whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's that plus a little bit more. Yeah, I think for a lot of 
younger professionals too, it might be a little bit intimidating to step into that leadership role. Um, but like you were talking, Carla, just be that intentionality. I think it goes into, you know, diversity of age as well. And our next question is, how do you as leaders measure diversity within your organizations for LGBTQ plus individuals? I can see how that's not something that's as maybe like forward facing as, you know, race or gender. Um, and how do you go about approaching those conversations? That piece, I would argue, is a little bit harder because, as you just pointed out, Chana, someone generally has to declare, right? You don't always know that. Um, you know a person of a certain eth ethnic background, you know, because they're literally wearing it, and you know gender, uh, but you don't know the other piece. Um, and so I, I think that we have to create environments where people are uh, much more comfortable uh, self-identifying, right? And I think we're getting there because, you, you know, companies obviously are you know, acknowledging the, the, the sexual preferences and the differences. And, you know, there are obviously affinity groups in, in lots of organizations. So it's getting better. But I, I can remember back 20 years ago, um, there were colleagues of mine who, you know, were deathly afraid of anybody finding out. And, and I don't think that uh, we are in that environment today. So still a long way to go, but I think um, leaders have to be conscious about creating an environment where people feel comfortable bringing all of who they are into that environment and therefore giving leadership the opportunity to try to create that equity around opportunities for leadership and responsibility. I, I, I Just to add, add on what Carla said, I, I think a person knows if this company or organization is a welcoming organization. Uh, we, we all know what it feels to be welcomed and we all feel, we all know what it feels to be isolated and not, not a place that is accepting. That's one thing. Perhaps the bigger question is when something goes wrong inside the company, with regard to diversity and inclusion, which is such a fragile subject, such a hot issue, what is the responsibility and the response from the leaders of the organization? And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you know whether or not the company stands for what it says and stands for what it believes and whether the company and its leaders are going to be bystanders or they're going to be into the and jump into the arena and face the problem and i think again it goes back to what i said earlier everyone's watching and a company has a memory and that memory is imprinted and people will remember when something happened and people look the other way so i think it's really critical that not only do we set up uh, what I would call off, being on offense in terms of setting up metrics to attract and retain, but also doing the things necessary to address with sensibility and the right level of leadership when problems emerge that are inconsistent with the values and guiding principles of what you believe you stand for. And uh, that's the hardest thing to do but that's the most damaging thing to, to ignore. Yeah. And our next question is in regards to some rural areas and they want to know how do business leaders in rural communities embrace diversity initiatives when the vast majority of these local populations are white? Hmm. That's a, that's interesting. Uh, I would, I would still offer up that even in somewhat homogenous populations, there is going to be diversity of experience. It may not be possible for you to bring in folks that are that look different if, if you're in a completely white environment or a completely black environment or completely you know, whatever your environment is. I still look for that grid factor around other diversity challenges. So making sure that you've got, again, we, we, we frame this a lot relative to sexual orientation, uh, skin color, religious preference, et cetera. Uh, but 
diversity is it can be found even inside homogenous populations. So we should be looking with a very broad spectrum to make sure that we've got folks who have different backgrounds and education, different upbringing here, different different locations there. There are there are ways for us to uh, to address it even in homogenous populations. So I would argue I would argue still it'd be great if the populations were a little bit more heterogeneous, but sometimes they're not. And I, th I think you can also be intentional, um, of, again, as I said earlier, just about making it happen. Uh, but I agree, you know, with the points that have been said about you don't want to just try to bring in one person uh, because the isolation, you know, that both Howard and Sandy have talked about, that's real. Um, and you won't keep them very long. So if you don't have it in your um, addressable geography of people that you would normally recruit from, then you have to go outside of that environment, but you gotta be thoughtful about how do you make sure that they are, you know, create an environment where they are successful when you, you know, bring somebody in from another city um, that might be of another uh, ethnic background. But if it were me and I was planning, I would definitely not just bring in one. Uh, I would I would bring in a couple uh, at that time, and I would also try to create an environment. You know, I'd be intentional as a company about what can I do about things in the community. How can I invest in the community? Um, you know, to help it along its journey um, and and create things that might be attractive to other populations. And if you think about large companies that are in geographic areas where they are there are not large multicultural populations. That is exactly their playbook. They start building around and investing in the community um, so that they can make the community at large a lot more attractive um, you know, to other, other demographics. And let's put a little more finer point on it. As I think about smaller companies and, and, and those companies being in smaller communities, especially in the Midwest, one thing that might, might be hard to change your community to Carla's point, it doesn't mean you don't try. But one hack for you might be as a CEO or as, as the founder, uh, you might decide that you want to put together a kitchen cabinet that is diverse. You may want to reach out to peers who can get you more connected to more diverse advisors, even though you may not be able to find that diversity in your community to hire, doesn't mean you can't avail yourself to the diversity personally. Yeah. And backtracking a little bit to when we were talking about, you know, companies, that are maybe talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And like when you put out a PR statement, when you say things, um, this audience member wants to know that in light of all the events in 2020, as leaders, how do you choose when, where, and how to take a stand as a business on different DE&I challenges? Well, I'll, I'll jump in because I, I think I have been uh, criticized a number of times over the years for allegedly using Starbucks as a political platform, uh, uh, which obviously is not the case. Um, I've come to believe that the rules of engagement for a company today and its leaders, private or public, is very, very different than in the past. And, uh, and as a result of that, I, I really believe it is the role and responsibility of the company to be engaged in a positive way that is apolitical in social issues that affect your employees and your customers. Uh, and it's pretty, hot, pretty hard in this day and age to open up the newspaper or watch the news, especially if you're a global company like we are, and not be affected by something that's going on around the world that perhaps is affecting your business, your employees, or your customers. So I think we have, we have believed that we want to be a respectful communicator uh, and, and do these things because we believe, or I believe, that our people have come to expect Starbucks to have a voice. And I think they, they look for that uh, as a reason and a sense of belonging because of the faith and confidence they have in what we stand for and the fact that we're 
not afraid to participate in the conversation. I think the hard part here is the apolitical part and to toggle back and forth to make sure that you're not taking a political position. You're simply communicating the values of the organization that you believe are in the best interest of your shareholders, your employees, and your, and your customers. The reverse of that, I think, is staying quiet and ignoring what's going on around the world because, uh, and it's ironic that the, the name of this panel is the word fear because you are afraid to raise your voice. I, I, I don't think anyone can be afraid to raise their voice on things that really are affecting us, our society and our business, and most importantly, our people. And I, I think people expect, your, expect leaders and expect the company to stand up for things that are true and righteous, and, and most importantly, uh, on the right side of the debate. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we certainly could talk about uh, voter oppression and what's going on in the state of Texas or Georgia or the work that Stacey Abrams is doing. Um, we can talk about our democracy. I mean, these are all things that, are, that affect us every day. And then the question is, what's our responsibility as a company? It's a personal question for every leader and every company. Uh, it's certainly a personal question for a board, uh, but I, I, I feel like you have to participate. I don't know if you agree with that, Carla or Sandy, but that's my view. Yeah, I, I tell you, Howard, I, I do. And I think if you think about where it's coming from, um, the, and it all ties together, the dominant population in the workforce is quickly becoming the millennials and the Zers. And they have frankly lived their lives out loud, you know, in the in the public eye, you know, with a vehicle called social media. Um, and they have exercised their voices in a way that we as boomers and older Xers uh, did not do, did not have the opportunity to do, it wasn't proper in society to do, but it's a whole different world now. And so these are the same people that are going to be dominating, uh, you know, the, the workforce. These are the same people that will be dominating, you know, the shareholder community and that will be inside these large asset management companies, which is why sustainability and all these other things are, you know, are direct questions now when you go to see your largest shareholders. Um, and, and increasingly the S in ESG is becoming the D, which is diversity. That's going to be something. So you, you're going to have to speak in some way. So I think the trick is to figure out uh, sooner rather than later what you will speak on and what you will stand for and to have a mechanism of listening to your employees and your shareholders to give you guidance on how that corporate voice will evolve uh, because they're demanding the voice. So the question is, you know, what will be the content when the voice is executed? Uh, but I agree with you, you're going to have to speak. Again, that genie cannot be put back in the bottle. Thank you. We're going to tackle one final question. And this audience member wants to know, how do you encourage leaders, particularly white men, with the power and potential to become diversity and inclusion allies, advocates, and champions? Howard, by trying to lead as best you can, as Howard points out, knowing full well that you won't do the perfect job anywhere near the, the, the amount that you want to. You do it with some high degree of humility and, and when you screw up as i've done any number of times you you publicly address your screw up and you, you talk you talk as best as you can from your heart and if you're if you're leading from your heart and your heart is a good heart that action will be understood that action will even be forgiven when it's not correct or a word is used in, incorrectly i as an example i was speaking a little bit about um both diversity inside the company, and it gets to a question someone was asking about the LGBTQIA+, I said incorrectly, sexual preference. Not, not the way one should describe it. And, and look, I, we've got a, a great crew of folks in our company. We've been through a lot together. And we have a really strong, uh, strong group in the LGBTQIA+, population of our company. And, and one of the really senior leaders in our company, who is a, a member of that uh, community as well, came over and said, hey, look, I got your back on this because uh, I know I know where your heart is, but dude, it's not preference, it's orientation. And I'm like, God, I know that, I know it's orientation. I screwed up and I was 
kicking myself for it. The next Monday meeting, I said, guys, look, not perfect, not going to be anywhere near perfect for a long time, screwed up, didn't mean to say preference, met orientation, you know, I know that, but I screwed up and I wanted to make sure that you knew that I screwed up and that's not going to happen again. And if it does, just bonk me on the head with a hammer and I'll, I'll figure it out. So I, just, I think just, it's just leading, leading from the heart and, and making sure you're authentic. And then when you make a mistake, it's not being afraid to address it because you're not going to be perfect. I, I, I think you, you, you benefit so much by surrounding yourself with people you can learn from. Uh, especially when you have issues you're trying and really trying to get underneath and, and because you don't have the answer, you don't have the life experience. I, I mean, I know that we as a company benefited dramatically uh, from Sherilyn Eiffel and Heather McGee, uh, people that we, we seeked out for help and guidance. Um, and also, I think we had to prove to them that we were sincere. Uh, and then obviously having Melody Hobson uh, at my side the last 20 years, uh, has been an enormous uh, friendship, but but also I think shared experience and and uh, there, there's no replacement for people who have had a different life experience who can help you and guide you through uh, experiences that you just are unfamiliar with as a and white male. Yeah, Probably. the only thing that I'll add, and first of all, again, amen uh, to both Sandy and Howard on both of those points. Uh, but the thing that I would say to the white male leader is, you know, have some courage. Um, it is scary. I'm going to give you that. Um, it feels a little uncomfortable. I'm going to give you that too. But that is why you're wearing the leadership journey, uh, which me, I mean, the jersey, excuse me. That is why you're wearing the leadership jersey. And you should have some courage around that. We all would make mistakes. And I'd say, Sandy, nobody's expecting you to be perfect, but people certainly are expecting you to have the courage to try and not let the fear stop you. And, and, I'll, and I'll close with one example about how we all can make mistakes. As you know, a learned, smart, self-aware black woman, <laughs> I would have argued that you know, I was very aware and really didn't have that much bias, but I laughed because we all have bias, but I'm gonna share my experience recently with what happened with the API community. When that terrible tragedy happened uh, in, uh, in Atlanta, I was incensed, I was angry, I was saddened, like you know, all of us were. Um, and then I thought to myself, oh my goodness, let me reach out because I have you know, two Asian young women on my team. And I said, oh, let me reach out and see how they're doing. Then I went, oh, wait, maybe they don't want me to reach out. Maybe they don't want me to talk about it. Who am I to be presumptuous? How do I know? I didn't mean I'd be feeling that way. You know, so I went through all of these things and I was paralyzed thinking maybe I shouldn't do anything. But then I said, Carla Harris, you cannot allow your ignorance or your inexperience stop you from expressing your humanity. So I stopped, I sat down and I wrote four sentences. Hey, I just want to let you know I am saddened and angry about what just happened in Atlanta, you know, to those six Asian women and the other two folks that were killed senselessly. And I just wanted to reach out and let you know that I'm here in case you wanted to express or not. Um, and I do pray that we get to a point in this country where we realize that it is our differences that make us a power collective. And the response that I got back from those two young ladies was just amazing. But I was so happy that I pushed through the fear. Somebody who considers herself, frankly, fearless, that even I, as a leader, was paralyzed for a moment thinking, oh, who am I? And am I doing the right thing? And I could go wrong. But we all, if we're wearing the leadership jersey, we all have to push through that fear and that trepidation and extend our hand so that we can make a difference and 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 move the organization along so i just wanted to share that as i close